So Isaiah, <clears throat> book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 62. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 62 will start in verse 8. And finish in verse 10. Isaiah 62 and verse 8. The Lord hath sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength. Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies. And the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for the which thou hast labored. But they, ha they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. And uh, the focus here for uh, the message I have for you is uh, a standard for the people. And a standard really is just uh, a set of rules, a set of principles that you would have uh, that would guide you in life. Okay, very simple. Uh, everyone has standards, everyone has rules, even the most rebellious and the unruly have rules. Um, and in the church, we have rules. In our homes, we have rules. In the office, there are rules. There are rules everywhere. Uh, if you're a, if you're an old hippie or an old rock and roller, you'd know the song "Sign, Sign Everywhere a Sign." You know, uh, you don't know that one. Uh, <laughs> well, you're not an old hippie then. Um, yeah, so you know, it's that rebellious crowd that didn't like the signs. They didn't like the rules. And, uh, but that's, uh, that's life and there's no way around it. Now, <coughs> in the church over the years, uh, there was uh, a doctrine that came up uh, that was always brought to our attentions and it was a warning. And there's something called standards, which are good, which are needed uh, to keep an organization uh, peaceful and to keep everybody on the straight and narrow and to continue going forward but uh, there's also something called legalism and I don't know uh, depending on what kind of church you're in and but oftentimes in the churches uh, one of the the complaints uh, of Christians might be oh this church is too legalistic you know I don't want to be in a church that's legalistic because I want to be free, I want to enjoy myself, you know. Uh, the idea of legalistic in that way would be too many rules. And uh, the kids, you know, they may not know the term to use it very well, but they may also complain the same way. Oh, Dad, Mom, you got too many rules. Oh, why do I have to do this? Why can't I do that? <coughs> but, I. And again, I don't know if you've heard the term used, legalism, but in the religious sense and in the church sense, legalism really is a doctrine. And legalism is the doctrine of salvation by good works. So for us, for uh, Brother Mike, I, I would imagine you uh, not understand this using that term, legalism is clearly... Um, if, if I'm preaching and teaching legalism, then I'm teaching and preaching that you need to be good or you need to fulfill the commandments of God, the commandments, right, many. You need to do good deeds. You need to be a good person in order to be saved. That's really uh, legalism as far as we are concerned from a religious perspective. And so... <coughs> But, but 
oftentimes the word lead, when, when a church or uh, a preacher or a Christian is accused of being legalistic, it's not necessarily because they're preaching a false salvation doctrine. The accuser just doesn't like the rules. And so they come into a church and they say, oh, you're too legalistic. Not because they're preaching a false salvation doctrine, but because they don't like the rules. <laughs> but rules are absolutely necessary. And because the letter, the Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, then there must be a way to um, set forth the rules, set forth the principles, but do it with the spirit of God and in the right spirit. And so <coughs> it's a standard uh, that's very important. It's good to have rules. Uh, rules are needed. Right, kids? Rules are needed. You know what? I, f <laughs> I find when the kids have rules and they know what the rules are, they're happier. You know, if there's no rules or uh, the kids don't know what the rules are, uh, they're not happy. Oh, they might be happy for a few minutes or maybe a few hours or a few days, uh, you know, running amok and doing whatever they want. But after a while, living life like that, uh, there's no happiness there. There's no happiness. There's no joy in chaos. Uh, you know, when I was young, ready to go to college, I thought if I could just get out from under the rule of my dad, I could be free and I'll be happy. But you know what? I did and I wasn't any happier. And uh, so a happy child is being in a home where his parents love him and there's rules. But the challenge is maintaining those rules. And um, <clears throat> Like my wife and I, we are forever trying to maintain the standard. You know, we'll set a standard and okay, you got to, you know, go to bed by 10, uh, no computer, you know, more than twice a day, one hour maximum, and then those rules get lost. <clears throat> the kids go to bed at 12, <laughs> the kids are on the computer all day. And, and then after, their, after a week or two weeks of this, uh, mom and dad are like, what's going on? Why are you on the computer? You know what? When it was really our fault that we let the standard slip, right? <coughs> so it's a big job, you know, setting a standard and maintaining the standard. Uh, when we got our house, we cleaned up the yard, we cleaned everything up, and we had enough time to keep everything clean the way we wanted. And we established a cleanliness standard. And we were able to do it. Every weekend, we could cut the grass, and we could, you know, make the flower bed look nice, and clean the kitchen, and everything looked good. And we set that standard, and we had a standard. And then all of a sudden we started doing more things. We got busier. My wife got promoted. I started getting busier. And all of a sudden the grass doesn't get cut. And all of a sudden the flower bed, the weeds are growing up and the kitchen's dirty and the toilet's dirty. And, you know, and so all of a sudden the standard goes down. <coughs> and when that happens, I say to myself, I can't wait till my kids get older so they can start doing something around the house, you know. <coughs> and <clears throat> that's why it's very important. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The Bible says that covetousness is a sin, and the desire to want more and more uh, can lead to a lot of trouble because the more you have, sometimes the standard will go down. Your standard can go down. And so... Uh, <clears throat> but we all need standards and 
everyone has to decide what their standard is. Uh, it could be a standard for your, you know, what you wear, your clothing. Uh, it could be a standard for how much makeup you wear. Uh, it could be a standard. It can go, you know, to all aspects of life. But Bible standards, <coughs> so Bible standards are not legalism. So if we have standards in the church, uh, we're not being legalistic. We just need these standards so that we all know, you know, what's expected of one another. Um, the, you know, we expect uh, a certain behavior from our kids. And thank you for uh, telling my kids, if you see them misbehaving, to stop misbehaving. That's unacceptable. Thank you for that, you know. Um, they need to know what the standard is for how they should behave in the church. Uh, the standard um, for us, for the older uh, folks, is for us to treat you like mothers and fathers. That's a Bible standard, right? <clears throat> mm. Go to Isaiah, just backwards, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Isaiah 59 verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so <coughs> everybody starts off in the same place. All of us. There's no difference between the Jew, between the Greek, between the Canadian, between the... Uh, uh, um, uh, Jamaican, between the Irish and the Scottish, there is no difference when it comes to all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all separated from God because of sin. And as you know, uh, God remedied that by sending his only begotten son into the world that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus Christ, should not perish but have everlasting life. Go to verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. <clears throat> and that standard of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not teaching legalism. Our rules are not... Uh, set up, whether it's like in the church, uh, so that we can uh, teach people that in order to be saved, you have to keep this rule, that rule, and, and or the Ten Commandments. But we do have to have a standard. And every church, every person is going to have to decide what that standard will be. <clears throat> and that's where people start separating. As soon as the rules come in and the, the standards come in, everybody has uh, maybe an opinion. Uh, what would separate a Christian from uh, out of one church into another church? Well, clothing. Clothing is definitely uh, a controversial issue. You know, some some Christians um, have a standard where uh, for for the women, dresses only, no pants. Right. <clears throat> um, <coughs> on that issue, the Bible says that uh, we're to be modest. Everything that we wear, we're to be modest. Now, one thing I will say about pants versus dresses for women, um, <clears throat> there's no verse that I've ever found specifically that says women cannot wear pants, but there is a verse in the scriptures, I believe it's Old Testament, where uh, women are not to wear that which pertaineth to a man. So 
Uh, now, you'll have to figure that out, right? But obviously, uh, God's rules is women and men should look different. In the New Testament, it's very clear. Men should have short hair. Women should have longer hair. <clears throat> and even those two issues um, would cause a Christian to leave a church if they heard that. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I would, um, I would, I take the position that yes, uh, in the church, when you come to church, when we gather together, ladies, I believe you should wear a, a dress. Men, you should wear uh, nice slacks. And uh, ladies, you should have longer hair, unless you, you can't. And uh, men, you should have shorter hair. If a man's got hair down to his uh, shoulders, um, you know, I believe that a man should have shorter hair. Now, there's men on TV and in, in, in uh, the Christian music and stuff like that. And again, uh, it goes back to, again, when you're accused of being legalistic, well, there has, there has to be rules. And so in a church that I'm uh, an overseer of, I wouldn't, like if someone walked through the door and they had long hair or, you know, a woman is wearing immodest clothing, I'm not going to run up to him and say, hey, you can't look like that, right? <laughs> I mean, I would never do that. Um, and I never have done that. And, but we're responsible for preaching the Word of God. And one of the challenges for the preacher is, do I want to see people come here? Yeah. Do I want to see people walk away angry? No. I don't want to see that. So, but the word of God and God's standard will make people angry and will make people walk away. <clears throat> Go to... Um, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm just going to go through um, some commandments. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 5 and verse Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So there's a, a commandment right there. There's a rule right there, uh, okay? So we are commanded to let our light so shine. And what would that light be? That would be uh, what we have inside of us, the Lord Jesus Christ. That would be the gospel <clears throat> that gives life to everyone. And so we're commanded to let our light so shine. And that would be a standard uh, by which the Lord or a principle or a rule that the Bible gives us. So there's a Bible standard. There's a Bible rule. <clears throat> and at some point in time... You know, the Bible says, for with the heart, men believe unto righteousness. You know, with the heart, you know, anytime you're going to make a decision to do something or follow something, uh, you'll never ever do it, really, unless you've 
made the decision with the heart. I don't know if any of you have ever had trouble uh, with smoking, but you know what, if you're a smoker, and many times you've like, I really want to quit, I really want to quit, um, but it's only until you get to that point where it's like, you know what, I'm going to quit. You determine in your heart that, you know what, I'm going to quit. But up until that time where you've really determined it and in the heart, it's just lip service, lip service, lip service. Oh, I want to get, my wife and her are always like, oh, we got to stop eating as much as we do. And, you know, we got to lose some weight. Ah, it's just lip service. You know, I say, I want to get to the gym and I want to feel uh, stronger and healthier. Well, you know what? It's just lip service so far. And until it's determined in the heart, for with the heart, men believe unto righteousness, until it's determined in the heart and you've made a decision that I am going to do this, it will never happen. <clears throat> So, that's why I believe uh, God, man might, but God does not put all the rules out there and say, you got to do this, 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 you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. He doesn't do that. that. That's not his way of promoting himself. His way of promoting himself is, I love you, I died for you, you're a sinner, and I want to save you. And I want to give you a better life, not only in eternity, but here on earth. Now that's, that's, a, that's, that's something people can get their head around. But man, if, you put, if the Lord had put all those rules and regulations you know, to be saved and to be a child of God, like like many do, uh, who'd want to come to him? You know, he just, you know, he gets you saved, he loves you, he makes you secure, and then he starts slowly showing you, you know, the things that he expects of you. And one of the things that he expects of us, his children, so we are the children of God, we're the saints, we're brothers and sisters, one of the things he expects is that we let our light shine before men. <clears throat> Uh, Mark 16, Mark 16, verse 15. <clears throat> Mark 16 and verse 15. Mark 16, verse 15. <clears throat> this one we know well. Mark 16 verse 15 <clears throat> and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature so this is a commandment this is a uh, standard um, some churches uh, have a very high standard in this uh, commandment and some churches uh, it doesn't even exist, and everything else is in between. <clears throat> uh, go to Hebrews 10, chapter 25. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 and verse 25 and all of us sitting here can give ourselves a pat on the back and say I'm doing this one Hebrews 10 25 not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together so you know it's like yes I can keep that standard and one of the one of the things is is that uh, Christians can fall into this trap and that is we can uh, the, the things that we're doing, we will set as the standard and judge others, but that just so happens to be the things that we're doing. Sometimes, uh, like for actually, oftentimes it's, it's sin, you know, something sinful. Oh, well, I don't do this and I don't do that, but yeah, you might be doing something else, right? <clears throat> Uh, 
How about this one? Galatians 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. <clears throat> Do you bear uh, your brother's burdens? Um, you know, when someone comes to you and they're burdened, and are you able to listen to them? Or is, you know, are you able to help them? Do you have a word uh, of encouragement from God to help them? Or is it too much of a burden to you? It's like, I don't want to hear this. I just want to, I just want to have fun. I just want to enjoy, you know. And one of the things, one of the thoughts that went through my mind as I was thinking about this message and our behavior, uh, our behavior in the church, one of the things I noticed when I first got saved and going into the church, I heard a few statements, and some of the statements were like, oh, we want to have an exciting church. We don't want to have a humdrum, boring church. And oftentimes, uh, old churches, and I'm not saying that they were preaching the gospel in that, but it just seemed that churches with some older people, there were no young people, there were no, it wasn't energetic. It's like, no, we don't want to be like that. And I'm telling you right now that it doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a church of just old people or a church of young people. What's most important is that the word of God is being preached and our behavior is becoming and pleasing to the Lord. I don't think, I don't believe that the church is to come together to entertain the kids. The church comes together so that we can praise God, so that the, the, the Bible can be taught, that doctrine can be taught, that we can sing praises and psalms and spiritual songs, um, partake in the Lord's Supper, and if the Lord gives us some food, money for food, then we can eat together, and then we go back into the world. <clears throat> And we, the Bible says, uh, be in the world, but be not of the world. So this is why we learn rules and standards, so that when we go into the world, we try to maintain those standards that we're trying so hard to do in the church. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ephes uh, how about this one? Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So there's a commandment from the Lord. Be filled with with the spirit right we have uh, some foreign students staying with us uh, we had a couple ladies from Mexico stay with us for two weeks uh, you know what they gave us as a gift a little bottle of tequila <laughs> tequila oh my <laughs> and I'm like woo I was looking for the worm <clears throat> And, uh, you know, do you think we were like, oh, no, how dare you? How dare you give us that bottle? Of no, we said, thank you very much. And we put it in our bedroom and we didn't say anything. Are we going to drink it? No. Are we going to drink it, Mom? No, we're not going to drink it. <laughs> You know, uh, we have to put, we have to open it up and pour it down the drain, right? How could we give it to How could we give it to someone, and we're not going to drink it ourselves, right? We have a we have a standard, and uh, that would be a good example of you know uh, 
do, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, I'm not going to get up here and go, I don't drink, and then I'm going to, you know, tempt someone else to drink. <clears throat> Uh, just a few more. Uh, uh, don't turn there because I'm going to run through a couple of these real quickly. But in Romans 12, 2, the Bible says, be not conformed to this world. And that, uh, that is a, a job in itself because the world is so tempting, isn't it? You know, the world has uh, a lot of sin and pleasure. And Brother Mike and I were talking earlier, the devil is a master at making things look innocent and harmless. But behind, behind the world, it, does, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's of the world, you can be sure that there's something that's you know, got the power to carry you into the next stage, all the way to, to sin. So the Bible warns us that we're not to be conformed to this world. But again, we're to use this world. I mean, all things are, are given to us. I mean, as a child of God, as far as I'm concerned, if, if this is my father's, then it's mine too. I'm going to use it, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to try and do the best I can to use it according to the way the Lord would have me use it. You know, uh, I always correct people. They say, uh, Money is the root of all evil. <laughs> is money the root of all evil? Now, you've heard me preach enough about that scripture to know that that's wrong. Is money, Norma, is money the root of all evil? That's what I know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a false statement. That's false doctrine. Because there's something missing. The Bible says the love of money right the love of money is the root of all evil but money in and of itself is not evil I remember Pastor Gatto uh, preaching one night he put a bottle of beer on the pulpit I don't know if it was empty or full but there was a beer bottle on the pulpit and he said this is not sin and he said it's it's in here and uh, well you know uh, some will debate that and uh, get into, you know, splitting hairs and all that. But the point of his message was right. You know, it's what's in the heart that would, you know, the, the lusting of the beer and then drinking it and consuming it. Uh, you know, there's lust in, in, in this old heart, right? And in this flesh. <clears throat> so money, you know, money itself is not evil. We need money in this uh, economy to live and to eat but the love of it the pursuit of it wanting more wanting more uh, is is the root of all evil for uh, for example flee fornication uh, you know which is um, a more common temptation and sin for well I, I wouldn't say this we're uh, young old uh, fornication uh, you know, the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, it's, uh, it's a temptation. And the standard is, is that for God's people, uh, if you want to have that kind of relationship, the Bible says get married. First, uh, First Corinthians, the Bible's very clear. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. I mean, that in its, itself should wake up uh, Catholics, you know, when the priests are commanded not to marry. The Bible says to have your own wife. The Bible says that the, the bishop must be the, 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 the husband of one wife. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you get, ever get an opportunity to preach the gospel or show the righteousness of God according to his word, Ask a Catholic, hey, uh, does your Bible teach that your priests should be celibate? Because my Bible teaches that men should have a, a wife. Now, if they, if they choose of their own free will not to have a wife, that's a different story. But to be that's a tradition of men. <coughs> 
So when you have standards uh, that are traditions of men, those can be questioned. Now, if we have standards in our home and it's not necessarily a standard of God, but it's just my wife or my own personal standard, uh, kids, you have to follow it. But in the church and what we preach and teach, I do not stand up here and give my own standard or my own tradition and try to teach you to do it. That would be wrong. <clears throat> uh, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. That's Philippians 1 verse 27. <clears throat> Another one, Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. And so the difference between my attitude when I was lost and saved is when I was lost, I was working hard for money, for some fame, uh, for just... Uh, my own pleasure, my own satisfaction. But now, as a saved child of God, I do it knowing that God is watching me. Uh, I do it for my family. The Bible says children are an inheritance unto the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So God has given my wife and I children. So I try my best to work hard for my children. And the Bible says that uh, it's the parents that are to lay up uh, 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 a inheritance for the children, not the children for the parents. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there's a few, and I want to end this uh, message with just a few um, like pieces of advice, just uh, how you would go about... Um, you know, uh, setting up some standards and then uh, following through with them. Um, the first thing I already had mentioned earlier is when you're, when you, when the Lord shows you something, right, and it's something that you're convicted to do or convicted not to do, um, you have to make up your mind, you know, to do it or not to do it. And so the first step, like I said, it's with the heart. You have to make a decision in your heart, okay? Um, it's to make up your mind that you're going to obey God. That's the bottom line. And um, that would be the first step. You know, when the gospel is preached and uh, people hear the gospel, those who get saved really came to that point where it's like, man, oh man, like they took the message serious, they understood it, they knew it was no joke, they knew they were a sinner, they knew there was a heaven, they knew there was a hell, they knew because of the gospel that if they didn't put their faith and trust in Christ, they were going to hell. <clears throat> I remember calling the, the pastor, um, and I was so troubled uh, about heaven and hell and, and having faith in Christ or not having faith in Christ. And I was thinking about my brother and who had never had a testimony of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was, uh, my brother was a, a homosexual and he, my brother died of AIDS uh, when I was probably in my mid-twenties or something. And I remember talking to Pastor Gatto and we were talking about Revelation and when, uh, those who had not had their name written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. I was uh, weeping, asking Pastor Gatto, is that true? Is my brother in hell? And it's yes, it's if he rejected uh, the saving gospel. And so I took the gospel seriously with my whole heart. I had to make a decision. So from the time of the gospel, when one gets saved to growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, you're always going to come to a point in times where the Lord is going to show you uh, something new. Especially if you come to church. Especially if you read the Bible. Uh, it's inevitable. 
So if you don't want to be convicted of the Word of God, don't go to church and don't read your Bible. <laughs> now, am I telling you not to go to church and don't read your Bible? No, I didn't tell you not to do that. I said if you don't want to be convicted. But you know what? If you're a child of God, you want to know. You want to know uh, how, to, uh, how you're going to please the Lord. <clears throat> the second thing uh, would be, remember that you're obligated under God to put up the warning sign where the bridge is out. You know what that means? If you're saved, I'm saved, we heard the gospel, we heard the warning, we are obligated to warn other people. You know, if you're uh, on the road and you came past a bridge that was washed away and you're walking this way and someone's coming this way and if you didn't warn them that there's no bridge and they're really like riding fast or driving fast, uh, what kind of person would you be? Uh, there's, there's things on the news. You know what I heard uh, in Toronto, I think in Scarborough, a week ago, an old lady, I think in Scarborough, got killed, got hit by a truck and then she got hit by another car and she was killed. Both drivers took off. The second driver that hit this old lady, he didn't hit her. Well, he, was the, he hit her the second time. He got out, looked at her, and took off. You know what? We have a responsibility to love our neighbors, right? <clears throat> uh, a third thing, love them and be genuinely interested in your people. And you know, this was uh, a great conviction of mine. Um, you know, when I first started coming here, I had a heavy burden for, for you people. You were coming, uh, you were trusting me, you wanted to know the Word of God, you, 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 and I had a burden. And then my burden grew and grew when people were like, oh, that's not a church, and you know, people didn't care, and, and I cared. I had a great burden. And you know yourselves that uh, you've seen some of my tears. Over, over time, sometimes we get a little hard, you know. But uh, as, a, as a servant of the Lord, I'm to have a love for you people. And I am to uh, genuinely be interested. There's that heart thing again, right? It's like not just, oh, how you doing? How you doing, finer? Yeah, well, I'm not feeling very, oh, that's fine. Good, good to hear you know, I'm to be genuinely interested in how you are, right? And if I'm genuinely interested, then I'm going to be genuinely interested. And I might end up telling you the truth, even if uh, I feel it might offend you, right? <clears throat> and same in our homes. You know what? Uh, Pray, pray for me. I'll pray for you, Brother Mike. You're probably better at this than me. But my kids, sometimes it's like, oh, hey, Dad, look. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And I mean, like, I really have to uh, make a real effort into stopping and paying attention to my kids. I'm not good at that. And I'm confessing it. The Bible says confess your faults one to another. So pray for me. And uh, I'm hoping that as some things, some stresses get away and things get done and I'm, I'm more clear-headed, I'm hoping that I can be more genuinely interested <clears throat> in my own kids. <clears throat> uh, there's a fourth thing. Don't expect, uh, th this is really good. Um, don't expect unsaved people to understand or appreciate what you are trying to get across to the saints. You know, uh, this may come to a this may be a surprise to you, maybe not. But 
by nature, I, w I want to please people. I don't want to offend people. Uh, you know, even when I got saved, I was really apprehensive to give the gospel out because I didn't want to lose my relationships. I didn't want to lose my friends. And uh, and that's, you know what? Some There are some things that just are in us that, boy, we can never get rid of. And although I might come up here and appear like, Yo, oh, wow, Brother Dan, he's not afraid to... Uh, to preach the truth or he's not you know or I go out and I preach the gospel on the streets and I get in with people and I, I look really brave you know what inside this heart there's a part of me that doesn't even want to say anything because I I want to be buddies I want to be friends right <clears throat> I don't want lost people to not like me I don't want them to say bad things about me you know, but but what I have to understand is they don't understand what we're doing. They don't understand that what we're doing, as long as it's biblical and it's the will of God, they don't understand that this is what they need. And so it's like having confidence in doing something that you believe is right. You know, the, the successful people, they don't care about what other people say. They're going to do it no matter what. And so I must say that one of the things that God has done for me as a man uh, from the time I got saved is he's given me uh, strength and courage and, a, and a, a standard that I could follow to be a stronger man than I was before. Now, you may be looking at me and going, Dan, you're not that strong, <laughs> or, you know, we, we don't see. But you know what? If you had known me before I got saved, you'd say, oh, Brother Dan, you're a better man or you're a stronger man now than, than you were, you know. <clears throat> and the last thing, last little piece of advice is use your head. And this is going back to um, when people come into the church and... Uh, they're not living up to the standards that the, the church set. You know, they're visitors, they're lost people. Uh, not to freak out on people and say, oh, you know, oh, or, or like, you know, someone comes, like using the NIV. Like, look, I've been preaching here for how many years, and I know people have used something other than, I never got on them, you know. I just kept preaching that the King James Bible is the word of God, but I never went over and them said, no, you can't bring that Bible in here. I never, ever did that. <clears throat> you know, the one good thing about being a Christian is we have the Holy Spirit of God to do all that dirty work for us. We just have to preach the truth. You know, if, and I'm learning this slowly, as long as I just preach the truth, I can just back away and let the Lord deal with it. The the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. I don't even have to get in there. And yeah. So we're to use our heads. We don't make big issues uh, over silly little things, right? Uh, things that will uh, straighten out uh, under preaching and over time, uh, it's just a matter of giving people time. That's really, really what it is. Giving people time. <clears throat> um, and we'll end on, on this scripture. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And verse 2. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. <clears throat> so, so the question that came to me uh, when this message started taking form, and that is, am I maintaining the standard 
that God uh, expects of me. Now, God does not expect me to maintain a standard of which I don't know of, right? But what I do know and what God has revealed to me since I've been saved is have I, uh, am I maintaining that standard that I'm responsible for? And I admit to you right now that in some areas of my life, no. And this message is for me that I have to get back to those standards. The Bible talks about the backslider, right? That, that's, what, that's what backsliding is. There, you were doing something at one time, and then you, you slid away from it. You, you, you stopped doing it. You, 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 went, you went away from it. And the Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the backslider in heart. Not that you can lose your salvation when you backslide away from a standard or two or more. But God's not pleased with it. So the question is, if it's for me, it's for you too. Is there standards of God that God has given you where you have backed away from? And if so, remember what... uh, was said earlier, the happiest child is the child that knows the rules, knows the standards, and are are obeying the standards. And you know what? I was pleased to hear my daughter remind me of a standard that we should be doing that we once did. And it was a blessing to my heart. And so... You know, we need each other to remind us uh, of the standards that we once had that maybe we're not doing anymore. So verse 2, uh, Coloss- Colossians chapter 4, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Let's pray. 